second story of the house, and it was a it was a tri level. So my bedroom window, if I opened it up, I could walk right out or climb right out onto my garage. Well, my cat had a way of being able to get up onto the roof, and that's how we let our cat in and let him sleep with us at night. I just loved my cat. His name was Tiger, and uh, he'd sneak in there and sleep with us. But sometimes I'd go out on the roof with him. And since we lived out in nature, there's no light debt, kind of like probably around here. There's not a lot of light, uh, not much light debt. It, it was really that the heavens were so just bright. Ever go camping away from everything? You just look up and you're just like, whoa, that just didn't happen by itself. There's something supernatural to that. And I remember out one night. I laid my blanket out on the roof, the place where I used to jump off the roof onto my trampoline. Don't try that at home, kids. I laid down the roof, put my blanket down, and I was stroking my cat and just petting him, just having a great time. As I looked up into the sky at 13 years of age, some big questions hit my mind that have never left me. A very impressionable moment, a light bulb moment, one of those transitional moments of your life. You know we all have those, don't we? And I asked a few questions of myself. When I saw the heavens and the stars in comparison with myself, I said, man, who, what, what on earth is the world in comparison with the vast galaxies out there? And man, who am I? Where have I come from? Where am I going? What on earth is this meaning? Why, am I, why on earth am I here and not somewhere else? And uh, anyways, this has been a journey for me, uh, studying the Bible and finding some of these answers. And these are, they call these the existential questions of life. Anyways, I'm going to go off that. I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to try to attempt to answer all those questions this morning. It takes, it's a big... To the screen here. I'm going to go through some questions here. So, this first question Who is man? Who are we? Who are we, anyways, right? If you have a pen and paper, you might want to jot down. I'm going to have some verses and things. I'm going to go through these things fairly rapidly, and then we're going to get on to the more practical side in the second half here. Who is man? A big question. In fact, in apologetics, uh, Pretty much the two biggest questions you can ask that a lot of other things fall under is, who is God, and who am I, right? So much of even belief systems hinge under those big thoughts. Obviously, there's more than just that, but those are pretty much some of the biggest questions. Now, <clears throat> who is man? I'm going to take this in specific, the, what we call uh, in systematic the theology, the constitutional nature of man. What constitutes, what makes me? What makes me? What, what am I composed of? I'm going to refer to a number of verses here. I'm sure that quite a few of you know. Genesis 2 verse 7. I'm going to list these off because we don't have time to go to all of them. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, and God um, <coughs> formed man out of the dust of the of the ground, right? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 is basically the reverse of this. This is the creation uh, of man. Genesis 2, verse 7, and Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 is like um, the passing away of a man, right? It says, and the dust will return to the earth, and the spirit will return to God who gave it, right? Uh, James 2.26, it says, with, As faith without works is what? Dead. So the body without the spirit is dead, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 6.19, there's another one you can check out. talks about our bodies at the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, Matthew 22.23, 37. Hebrews 4, verse 12, I like, talks about the Word of God being uh, powerful, being able to uh, reach the uh, all parts of our body. It lists, basically lists three categories. Uh, body, mind, and spirit. Okay? Mental, physical, 
spiritual. Matthew twenty two thirty seven says, "You will love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul." Souls translated suke, which basically, and one of the translations means your whole being. Okay. Now, might be a little bit fuzzy, but my attempt is to try to bring this and make this clear. Okay. <clears throat> this is a uh, a quote from Ellen White, uh, Education, page seventy-five, first paragraph. It says, "Through the divineness was marred and well nigh obliterated." Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision was dimmed. He had become subject to death. So what three areas did she refer to there? She was referring to three different parts of, of man, right? The, the Since man has been degenerated, well, those are the mental the physical and the spiritual, right? Now, now, if you continue on here, she says, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection which was developed, or which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of, I like these three phases, uh, phrases are incredible. This was to be the work of redemption. This was the object of education. The great object of life. So these three ways we have fallen, right? This physical body. We have fallen. But in these three ways, God wants to re what? Restore us, regenerate us, renew us. Now, I have a picture here. You might not be able to see it. I'll try to stand back. But there's a, right here, it says, the creation of man, created in perfection. And if anyone needs to get up and move closer, feel free to. Um, but then we see the fault where man fell in these three areas, mentally, physically, spiritually. But then we see the cross, and that's ultimately the purpose of redemption, is that God wanted to not let us fall beyond repair. He wanted to plunge down, like what Pastor Ben's story got down the incarnation, stepped out of his world, stepped into our world, grabbed us, and wanted to, through this, uh, not just uh, ethereally save us from our sins, but literally impart his, his, own, uh, his own abilities in us to be able to restore us, and then take us into eternity. Okay, so this is referred to as the nature of man, okay? Or you can say the constitutional nature of man. So there's the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. You hear a lot of stuff going on recently. Uh, if you look in news articles on health stuff, they call this mind, body, and spirit, right? I'm going to share the difference because uh, you can go new age with this in, in, uh, if you're not careful. Anyways, the Adventist, the whole Adventist system I was studying this, and it's like, this is interesting. The whole system of Adventism is actually built upon this very concept. Watch. Okay, Adventism has three main branches. It has our churches, right, which take care of what? The spiritual part of man. It has the health system, which takes care of what? The physical part of man, and not just the health system, but the health message, which refers to the, uh, the preventative, right, uh, context of the health, of our health. And then it has the educational system, uh, which is, is intending to do what? Restore the mental faculties in man. See, all three of these, our whole system is built upon this concept that man has fallen. Man is a mental, a physical, and a spiritual being, and all three of these areas have fallen, and it is God's intent to restore in man his original image, mentally, physically, spiritually. Isn't that cool? I was, I was looking at this as like, you know, if you look at most schools, they have a seal that shows who they are, right? And if you look on most of those seals, this is a picture of Walla Walla 
university where I graduated a few years ago. And on the seal, this is an older picture. It wasn't a, it's not an up-to-date one. But I found it. And guess what it says right in the middle here? No, this is not the Illuminati. <laughs> it says, what? Physical, mental, spiritual. And most of our schools have that inside of like the picture or somewhere representing what the school is about, right? Isn't that interesting? It's been around us the whole time. So this idea, once again, of the physical, mental, spiritual, we have fallen in these areas and is intent of God to restore in man this. Now, to get a little bit, just a little bit deeper, there is two major concepts um, in philosophy. Uh, one is called monism. The other one is called dualism. Does anyone, can, can you say that with me? Monism. Got it? And can you say dualism? Got it? All right. I'm going to explain what this is. Real quick, dualism or monism is the basic concept that man is essentially one one being together. You, as soon as these things become separated, you're, you cease to exist. There is no consciousness in your spirit outside of your body. Dualism it comes from Platonic um, philosophy, which is Greek philosophy, the pagan philosophy about reality. This says that uh, their belief system was basically, you can, different facets of it, but the body is evil and the spirit is good. You can do whatever you want in your body because the spirit is perfect and good and it will eventually ascend into the heavens and you will ascend with it and that you will live in this eternal bliss of perfection separate from your body. Obviously, we believe that there will be a resurrection, right? And the two will come back together, right? And we will be reunited uh, with the Lord. We'll have a new body, amen. <laughs> but... Uh, this is the difference. So I'm going to explain monism a little bit closer because this is more what Adventists believe. And I believe not just what Adventists believe. I believe it's the truth. I've been studying this out and I thought, man, this is so relevant to what we deal with today. Mon monism, the first word, a part of the word comes from the Greek uh, mono, mono, which in the Greek definition means alone, single, or one. Okay. Now you're thinking, man, how much further is he going to go with this? <laughs> Almost done with it, okay? Now we can see this in our modern language for an example, monotheism. What is monotheism? We believe in one God, right? That there is uh, this unity in the, in the Trinity, right? That there is one God, okay? What about monopoly? It's one of, yeah, that's right. A monopoly, remember Microsoft was uh, taken to court because they believe they had become a monopoly. There was one business uh, dominating the market, right? Um, how about monogamy? You probably all believe in that in this room, right? <laughs> one spouse, not multiple spouses, right? So... These are actually things, uh, you know, monotheism, something we believe in. Monogamy, something we definitely believe in. Monopoly, something we, uh, as a nation, have believed it's not good. We need to have uh, availability for other small businesses to thrive. So monotheism is this idea that all three, here, I'll read it here. Monotheism insists that humans are not thought of as any sense composed of different separate parts, but rather this radical unity. Does that make sense? This radical unity. These things must exist together to be alive. So the mental, the physical, and the spiritual, you can't take someone's brain out of them and then continue to exist, right? You can't chop off, chop a person in half and expect them to still exist. These things have to be together. And this is a, actually, I think we should engage society today, and especially there's a lot of pagan religions on the rise, isn't there? New Age, on the rise like crazy. These religions are r growing faster than most Christian religions. And this is something that we can actually, Adventist theology can relate with. 
and and talk about what them with. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about these things. This is something we can discuss and have something to contribute. So, in saying now, what is man? Hopefully that was somewhat clear. Mental, physical, spiritual. We declined. God seek, sought to restore us mentally, physically, spiritually. But how does restoration actually take place? This upward cycle of restoration. How does it take place, and why does it even matter, and how does it even relate to outreach? You're probably thinking you're crazy. There's no way this could relate to outreach. Well, it distinctively does, and I'll bring you there as we come to the end here. So, I want to read a verse to you. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, if you want to turn there quickly. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 really like this verse. It's really got a lot of depth in it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Okay, great text. I know we've heard this probably ever since we were kids, right? But what does it mean? Not just what does it say, but what does it mean? Okay, I like this. If you, um, if you look in the, uh, in the Greek here, there's a difference between conformed and transformed, and we're going to look at that. But it says the way we are actually transformed is how? But be transformed by how? The renewing of your mind. What is the nature of man? It's the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. Okay? It says by the renewing of your mind. I like how someone mentioned this the other day. It's like your body is an elephant, and you're on top of it with these little things, and you are controlling, like, you know, see those little guys over in Africa or over in India? There's little tiny guys on top of this big elephant and just cruising around telling them where to go. That's kind of like what the mind is, right? It controls the whole body, the seat of the will. <clears throat> it's interesting. I have a couple stories to share here. There's this man um, named... Vance Vanders, and these are completely true stories. I am not making them up. This guy named Vance Vanders, he was wanting a shortcut from home, uh, to, uh, to get home from work. So he tr goes through the cemetery, and it's in the evening, it's getting dark. And as he's going through the cemetery, he is confronted by the local witch doctor. The witch doctor comes up close to him, grabs him, and puts this thing under his nose. It just reeks of smell. And then he says, you're going to come down with a sickness, and you are going to die, and there's nothing that any medical doctors can do to save you. And then he's like, oh, but you know, it's, if that happened to you, you'd be freaked out, right? And he goes running home, goes home. The next morning, he wakes up. He feels sick. He takes a day off of work. The next day, he feels worse. His bones are ache, his bones and, and muscles are aching. He can't move around in bed. After a week, he ends up going to the hospital. He's actually hospitalized. And uh, after another week, finally, the wife actually tells the doctor what had happened. She, and he's like, oh no. So he gathered the whole family together and he told them, he said, listen, we're going to perform a ceremony. He got Vance together with them and he said, listen, I went to that cemetery and I found that uh, witch doctor, and I held him up against something, and I asked him, what did you do to my friend? Tell me, what did you do, and how can I reverse what you've done? And he says, that witch doctor told me, he says that uh, when he grabbed you, he had uh, lizard eggs, and he rubbed some of them into your stomach. And he says, and one of those lizard eggs hatched, and is inside of you, and it's eating you inside out. <laughs> so he said, what we're going to do is we're going to perform a ceremony, and we're going to get that lizard out. And he, okay, okay. So they get this big syringe, 
and he injects him with this fluid, and it was for actually to vomit, right? And uh, so he's vomiting, Vance is vomiting, his family's there, they're having this ceremony, like they're going to get this lizard out. And just before, the doctor had gone to the pet store and had purchased a little lizard. And as he's throwing up, obviously you're not paying a lot of attention while you're throwing up, the doctor slips the lizard into the stuff. <laughs> and uh, and he goes, Vance, look, the, the lizard, it came out. You're, 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 you're healed. And Vance goes, oh, oh, lays back, falls into this deep sleep. And four hours later, wakes up ravenously hungry and goes home completely fine. Mind over matter. How does it say? We can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Story number two. Sam Schumann was told that he had metastatic um, liver cancer. So he went uh, home and he believed this. The doctors told him he only had three months to live. Three months. Can you imagine the terror, the feeling, man, I only have three months to live. He went home, lived out his days, and passed away. Well, when they did a biopsy on his body, they found out that um, the physicians had done something incorrect. Actually, he did not have metastatic liver cancer, and it w did not spread to his whole body. Actually, there was only a very small tumor, and it was inside of his liver. Very small, and it wasn't even cancerous. Sam Schumann had died believing that he had cancer throughout his body when he actually didn't. In fact, it's interesting. Someone was locked inside of a refrigerator once that was broken. They thought, or it was a freezer that was broken. They went to go, uh, they finally found out what happened. They opened up the freezer, went in, and this person that, there is no, nothing inside this, this uh, freezer that would make it cold, but his body was actually frozen to death. Because he believed it so strongly, his body actually did that to itself. It's crazy what you believe has power over you. But you have power over what you believe, amen? You have power over what you believe. One last story. Derek Adams, he was on this um, this deal for um, uh, taking these medications. It was a tryout for some doctors, and he was on this. And during the process of taking these medications as this test for doctors, uh, he was one of these uh, different number of different people that were taking these medications on trial. What's that? A guinea, thank you. Get very exactly, a guinea pig. His girlfriend broke up with him. Well, he went home and not thinking too straight, right? Because your emotions are so flared up. He goes home and grabs those pills and downs all of them. Feels he he's like, oh no, what did I do? He gets on the phone and calls nine one one quickly. The 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 people at the hospital, the ambulance arrived, taken to the hospital. He had a number of things happening to him. His, his body was convulsing. He, he couldn't think clearly, and he was having irregular heartbeats. Well, they thought, man, what are we going to do? So they found that bottle. They got looked on the bottom, and they called the number, and they said, listen, something's happening terrible this guy. We don't know how to treat it until we know what it is that he was taking. They said, you are taking, he was taking placebo. If you don't know what placebo is, it's a sugar pill. They told him, they said, hey, Derek, you're on a sugar pill. It's going to be okay. Within 15 minutes, his heart rate was back to normal. His blood pressure had come back to what it was. His mind was not longer confused. He was fine, and he walked right out of the hospital. Now, these are shared in the negative. <laughs> but what can you use your mind to do in the positive, right? Right? It's just incredible the power the mind has over your body. Now, uh, the word in this translation, don't be conformed, but be, what does it say? Transformed, right? The word conformed is, comes from the Greek word suskimatizo, 
which literally means, literally means to be molded or stamped according to a pattern. You ever stamped a cookie or something? Or uh, I call the houses, some of the developments where all the houses look very similar, um, they call them cookie cutters, right? Not that they're bad houses, it's just they look very similar, so they call them cookie cutters, right? Um, basically, a translation also used for this is called, is, is written, don't be squeezed into the mold of this world. Does the world have pressure to conform? Oh, yes, it does, doesn't it? Everywhere you go, every advertisement you see, you get on, I, I get on Facebook to commu communicate with friends, and they have this sort of clothing, and they have that sort of clothing, and they have this sort of person you're supposed to be around. You're supposed to drink this sort of thing and act like this and do this and do that. And I'm not saying everything is evil, but there is a very clear pressure, right, to conform. And we think sometimes this is something that just young people deal with, right? Oh, no. This is throughout your whole life, right? I mean, even you get older, you see a barbecue on TV and some guy drinking at the barbecue and flipping his ribs over, right? There's this pressure that you have to have this big monster barbecue that can practically power a vehicle, right? <laughs> there's always these different pressures for different types of people, male or female, and different ages. There's all these different pressures, right? So the, what it's saying in the Bible here is the world is trying to push you into its mold. Trying to do what? It's trying to form you into something. Transformed comes from the Greek word metamorphu which we get the word metamorphis, right? It's the English word I says, it says here, metamorphis. When a tadpole is changed into a frog or a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, right? We speak of this as a metamorphis. So have you ever seen a time lapse? I wasn't able to attach this, but you should go home and look at the time lapse of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. They... S they slither down some branch, and then they connect the top of their body to the branch, and then you see all the outside of it kind of come up, and they s eat it or spit it. I don't know what happens. Any Mr. Norris would probably know. Animal guy <laughs> knows a lot about that stuff. And then you see the body is just wiggle and wiggle and wiggle, and then all of a sudden you see this, this layer. There's this layer on the outside, but you don't see what's going on on the inside very much at all, do you? You just see on the outside this movement, right? See a little bit coloring changing, but you can't tell what's going on on the inside. And in time, it breaks open and out pops a, what do you know? It's a butterfly. Isn't that crazy? The internal change cannot be seen initially. The internal change is seen at the end. That's very true, I think, with us spiritually. Sometimes we want to see the external change Come on, make the change. Why don't you change? Why don't you do this? Why don't you? We get angry at our, each other, our own family, and at ourselves. Let's be honest. Do you ever get frustrated with your own spiritual growth? Well, be encouraged. The real change God is trying to change you is from the inside. And you will see changes on the outside. But if you don't do it on the inside out, it's not a lasting change. It's not a lasting change. Actually, this word metamorph, uh, metamorphu is listed only four times, four occurrences in the New Testament. Uh, and 2 Corinthians 3.18 is one. By beholding, we become changed, right? This inward, we think differently when we behold the unconditional, unmatchless, amazing love of God. Matthew 17 and Mark 9.2 says, And he was transfigured. He was before them, this is referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, Second Corinthians four sixteen. Here's not direct metamorphu verses, but this idea of this inward change it talks about our inward man being renewed day by day, even though our outward man is perishing. Right? <clears throat> Ephesians three sixteen. Same thing. First Samuel sixteen seven. Um, but. God is speaking with Samuel, and he says, don't look at man on the outside as he's trying to pick a king. He goes, because God looks at the heart. And I think that's something that we as Christians, we have to work on. 
not to look on the outside, look at where someone's at, how we perceive them, but Lord, help me to see them how you see them. And that's tough work. Uh, this idea, though, that how powerful the mind is, how you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One more story, and this is in the positive. This, there was this imprisoned golf player. He had played, he was a professional golf player, he was in prison for five years, and every single day he played golf in prison. How, do you say? In his mind. He sat in his cell, and he, and he played through a full 18 holes of golf. And I, and I just started learning how to play golf. It's a lot of fun, but you have to be so precise. You have to learn how to plant your feet, and man, my arm got really sore after the driving range of a, about 100 balls, but it was a blast. I'm terrible at it still, but it's a blast. But he played through this, and five years later, he was let out of prison. What do you think he did the first thing? He wanted to go play golf. So where did he head? Went to the golf course. And guess what his score was? It was the best he had ever done without touching it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's just so fascinating. The ability of the mind. I like that one verse is casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. Putting yourself under the control of God because he's the only one you can trust yourself with. You can't trust yourself with the devil. You can't trust yourself with yourself. But you can trust yourself with God. Amen? And that's good news. <clears throat> All right, I want to read a quick story here, show you a few things out of this one story in the Bible, and then we'll close here. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We're going to read this quickly. If you want to turn there, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is Jesus healing the paralytic. Verse 1 says, And again, he entered Capernaum, after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room for them to receive them, even not even near the door. So they're in this house, Jesus speaking, people are packed around him. You can't even get close to the door. It's so packed, right? And he preached the word to them. He's in there, and he's sharing with them. He's speaking to them. He's, he's sharing with them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And obviously they couldn't get in, says in verse 4, they could not come near him because of the crowd. So they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let him down the bed, which the paralytic was lying. You can imagine wanting to see Jesus so badly that they tore this unknown person's, perhaps this unknown person's roof apart and let this man down through the rafters. Can you imagine we're sitting here and all of a sudden all this dust and junk starts falling down from the roof? <laughs> And this person is let down through the roof because they want to see someone inside so badly. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, paralytic is what? What is a paralytic? Modern word is someone that is paralyzed, right? So they didn't have function of certain parts of their body. Could have been a pair or quadriplegic. We don't know. <clears throat> but Jesus, uh, he said, he said um, son, your sins are forgiven. Why don't you think about that? Why would Jesus say your sins are forgiven? Why wouldn't he say rise up, take your bed, and walk? I've noticed this consistent theme. It's not every single story, but a lot of the healing scenarios, Jesus does not immediately uh, deal with the actual physical impairment. He deals with something else first. Let me read you this. The Hebrews writers had recognized the essential unity of body, mind, and spirit and had stressed the relative dependence upon one another. When Jesus approached this man, being the paralytic, as one whose primary need was for assurance of forgiveness, he was reflecting the Jewish thinking of his day. That sin and health are, what? Related. But in a larger sense, that he was demonstrating a recognition of the relationship which exists between the attitudes of the mind and health 
and the body. It's interesting. Also, this is another quote from another book. Physicians have discovered that guilt, like anxiety, may serve to inhibit or even paralyze functions of the body or mind. Think about the culture back then and how guilt-ridden so many of the people were. If you had any physical impairment, that meant that you were a sinner and that you were being judged by God, right? So these people would have been terribly guilt-ridden even if this wasn't their fault. And they would have been ruled and controlled by guilt most of their lives in shame. Who I am is wrong. It's interesting, this book called Jesus and Logotherapy. The boy was approached not in terms of his paralyzed legs, at least initially, but on the level of his spiritual problems. That's interesting, right? Torn apart by a sense of sin, perhaps precipitated by adolescent feelings of guilt. We don't know, but that's perhaps. This young man needed Jesus' reassurance of God's forgiveness of his sins. Wow. This is fascinating to me. You look at story after story after story, and Jesus comes, and he looks beyond the external, the physical need, and he sees the inner spiritual need. He comes, and he reaches that inner need, and then he goes, oh, by the way, you can walk now. And sometimes, if you study... Um, modern biblical psychology, biblical psychology, you'll notice that this actually does, as you change your thinking, it changes your neurobiological landscape of your brain, which then changes your physiological abilities of your body, and you become free. That's why the Bible says, you shall know the, know, have a, not just know a knowledge, but a relationship with the truth, and the truth will bloop, set you free. That's good news. The truth will actually change you from the inside out. Okay. So why does this matter? What is the, on earth does this have to do with outreach? Reaching people, working with people, trying to bring people to Christ. How does this even relate? Well, it actually relates and very much so. This is a big theme I'm trying to hit and a big theme I'm trying to discuss is that naturally, the world, we try to pressure people from the outside in. But Jesus, as he works on people, he works, he does surgery. He goes in. And he tries to work on people from the inside out. Example. Um, when I go door to door, one of the top reasons, I'd say the top three or four reasons why people are atheists, let me give you one of them that directly relates with this. Religion was pushed on me. That's a real, that's a real struggle, church family. That's a real thing that I have to face all summer long. People sharing how religion was pushed, was pushed on them. <clears throat> and I think that's something as a church we're really starting to realize and like, wait, it doesn't work like that. Jesus really does work from the inside out. Doesn't mean we never say anything. Doesn't mean we never challenge people. Doesn't mean we never uh, confront people. That's, I'm not saying that sort of stuff, right? There is a time and place for that, absolutely. But I'm talking about that's the whole Protestant Reformation. Could be really summed up in one way in this. Religion was what? Pushed and controlled and dominated on people. And as a reaction, people protested and pushed back. And see, that's the thing. People intuitively know when you push something that, God, I don't understand philosophically or even logically how, uh, how that doesn't make sense, but I just know this is wrong. Right? Does that make sense? Intuitively, if someone pushes you, you're going to, like, stand your ground, right? And maybe even push back if you haven't surrendered your heart to the Lord that morning, like, Sometimes happens a lot of this, right? <laughs> but um, this idea is so valid and so important to keep in mind. Not just in how God is working on others, but also how God is working on me. Amen? God's changing you. The inner man is being renewed. It says day by day, even though the outer man is perishing. Anyways, this is just exciting and good news to me. Um, 
how God changes us and how God changes others and how it relates on how we can work with God in, in reaching other people. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this blessed day and for us to be here together um, worshiping you and giving ourselves to you. And we just thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, help us in aiding you and what you're trying to do in others. We ask this all and give ourselves to you because you've given yourself to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many verses would you like to do? Our closing hymn today is number 330.